Hey, and welcome back everyone to our weekly Orboot and Rust and so on hacking streams. So, uh, today we're going to look at something uh, a bit different again. So, last time uh, we were talking about the very early and initial uh, part of the boot process, and that was what we eventually uh, sort of figured out. Um, the last part that we finished was the uh, macros that we can use for printing to the serial. And now we're going to look at the boot flow again. So I've already prepared something here. Uh, if you recall it from earlier streams, that's because we already talked about it. And we talked about the replacement strategy for uh, the vendor firmware that we already were given uh, and what our design would be with the R boot flow. So essentially, um, this is what we have in the documentation already for R boot. So we've also looked at this here. Uh, when it was through a pull request, as you can see, it's now in the main branch here. So it's already merged. And uh, what we have down here is a graphic that explains you the different pieces that we put in a flash part in firmware, uh, which represent the different stages that the firmware goes through. So uh, let's have a very quick look at that first. So up here, um, this is where we initially start. Uh, we have the very, very first part of our boot. So that is exactly what we also looked at last time and uh, the few times before. Um, this is the very early initial uh, part that is executed and it's executed in SRAM. So when uh, remember when we turn on the Vision 5 board with a JH7100 SOC, what happens first is that the mask room loads a 32K chunk or a 60... I think it's 16k chunk, so you know a very very tiny tiny bit uh, into its SRAM. So the SRAM is not very small, um, and then starts executing it. And so the question now is, uh, how do we get to the other parts actually? So we we already saw that working, right? And so uh, a, a little uh, thing which is a bit special about the Vision Five now or the JH Seven One Hundred, um, there is actually a second bank of X. Uh, of SRAM. And we can actually look at that in the documentation again, um, which we also looked at earlier when we looked at the memory map. So yeah, this uh, sort of also represents the memory map eventually. Um, anyway, so let's look at this here. So this is the second part of the boot flow. And we like to call this, uh, in, in core boot, we call this the RAM stage or you know, whatever is uh, being executed uh, when DRAM has been initialized. And well, um, in, in the flash part, uh, that's actually, um, there is actually a bit more uh, than, uh, you know, what is actually executed in DRAM. And if you look at this very closely, um, there is something that we call Orbu DTFS. And DTFS is just a very brief representation of this whole layout here again. So it's basically like a partitioning scheme, if you will. It's just written in the syntax that has been made for a device tree. So what we also use to describe the uh, layout of the entire main board uh, to the operating system. And well, then our eventual stage is the Linux boot stage. So Linux boot is actually also then being executed from DRAM. And this is where we then have our final bootloader environment. Or we can already use it as a production kernel if we want it, depending on the use case. Anyway, so essentially it, it always um, depends a bit on the very specific hardware, how we can boot exactly. So that's why, you know, we, we have to have a bit of a loose concept here and then we need to apply it to the re respective environment. So um, yeah, for the JH7100, uh, it almost applies like here, um, but we need to have something in between here uh, just because we have limited SRAM size. So, yeah, as I said, it's 16K. Uh, that's for the first bank of SRAM. And there is a second one, which also contains a 16K size uh, chunk of memory. So in this um, second part, we can then load another uh, little blob that would just do the DRAM initialization. And yeah, so let's actually look at what uh, we also did initially where uh, we, we drew a bit of a sketch um, and that looked like this here. Uh, let me just zoom in a bit. 
So we try to model what the vendor is uh, doing currently. So this is uh, what you find in uh, also in the documentation that they have. Um, and this is also uh, actually what, what we just uh, redrew. So we just took the, um, the rough explanation from the uh, PDF that they released. And then we, we just, um, you know, uh, made, made this very, very simple representation of the boot flow. Now, I want to make a few changes here um, and have some comments because this is actually uh, now something we can map to this here, right? So first of all, um, let me copy this whole thing. So uh, we just mark everything. I will put that here and then have another copy and now let's say what we currently let me just shrink the window a bit um, so what we currently have is uh, we, we already have this here replaced by our boot and we call it BT0 currently okay so this is what we now have and now I actually want to map this just like uh, in the picture down here and so I will draw something in addition here, which is the memory parts. And well, these two pieces here would be running in DRAM eventually. Uh, font size, what font size do we have? Text. Oh, look. Oh, we have dark mode. Huh. Much nicer. I'm not sure if this is new. I just saw it right now. Anyway, so. What is the size? It's 20 and, well, bold, of course. Let's go with 20 here as well. Nice. Okay, so this year would both happen, the open SPI part and the UWood part are running in DRAM. The second boot or our replacement would be running in SRAM 1. And now the second part would be running in SRAM2. Just like that. So yeah, let's move things around a bit like this. Okay. And now I want to draw the next step that we want to do, which is, again, we just copy everything here. And what we want to have now is our boot main and this will contain something called Rust SBI. And today we are going to look a bit closer at what Rust SBI exactly is and how we can use it in our flow now. So yeah. Um, and I would actually like to add something more. Um, just because it's uh, actually applicable. And that's also the reason why this year is called second boot. Uh, whereas in, in our boot, we, we start with a soft part. So we call this year boot zero currently or BT zero. Um, it doesn't really matter too much, but there is something uh, that we were, well, let's actually copy another box. So there is something that we always neglected here. And that is the mass crum. So the mass crum, is the part which is really just inside the chip so it cannot be replaced anymore. So this is really hardwired circuitry, right? Now let me just anchor this here. Thank you. And I'll happily copy that over again and again. Anchor the arrow again like this. And here we go. All right, so um, where does the mass chrome actually run? Well, that's a very good question. And I think it's just an assumption. I think everything in the mass chrome is just, uh, actually we can copy another box again. I think it's just executed in place and it actually has its own space in the memory map. So, well, these here are also executed in place once they are copied. So let's actually uh, 
it's actually just right here that this here is just MMIO mapped. So yeah, we can uh, we we can look at that again. Um, anyway, now now we have the full picture again, and uh, you know we we have a comparison of all the different components here. Well, and while we're at it, we can actually also copy this one ag again and say we would actually like to end up with Linux boot instead of U-boot proper. And also, well, it might be that we can uh, shrink those two here enough so that they actually fit in the same SRAM space. So in that case, this would turn into this. Uh, well, how do we sketch this a bit better? Let's just say with your in it, like this. So yeah, this is uh, pretty funny in a way because this is actually also uh, the hardest part usually. So the DRAM in it here, um, it's not only that banners are very uh, reductant when it comes to documenting the DRAM parts. Um, it's also that depending on the platform, but um, I I've seen this uh, quite a bit now, uh, the DRAM initialization is actually a very large portion of code. Um, which essentially means writing and reading lots of registers. And in some cases, if it's, uh, you know, just, um, so you, you can do that in, in different ways. Uh, you can just, uh, you know, do some evaluation of what DRAM parts you have, and then just, uh, you know, document all the results that you got from uh, measuring timings and stuff like that, and then hard code that uh, into your um, specific uh, from a part for a very specific given mainboard. Um, so the thing is, if you then design a bit of a different mainboard where, you know, the memory lanes might be slightly larger or something, um, you know, then, then you would need to take new measurements again. But that's actually uh, one way of uh, hiding the process of talking to the DRAM controller and doing the measurements at, run at runtime. So, yeah depending on uh, what platform you look at and what the vendor provides, it might be that it's, it's really just hard-coded values. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you know, you just get a binary blob like uh, with what Intel is doing currently, for example. Um, yeah, so in, in our case, it was actually like there was, a, we, we do have a source code repository uh, where there is like, I think four or five different variants of, uh, you know, initializing DRAM and then also different branches of that again and so on with just different hard-coded values, right? So, yeah. But that's not what we want to look uh, too much at right now. Just wanted to elaborate on the size here, actually not even uh, being made up, but actually quite applicable. So, yeah, I mean, eventually, of course, our Linux boot part here would also be quite large because Linux, uh, you know, so a very uh, capable kernel. Uh, we embed um, an entire uh, system around it with you know all the commands and so on. Uh, just like with you would actually, well, you you would would be a bit smaller, but um, you would actually like to leverage the drivers that Linux would and not you know have them replicated because the eventual production kernel, if you continue with another Linux kernel after you would or whatever, will actually have the exact same drivers again. So yeah. Um, so yeah, with, with that picture in mind, so this here is what we currently have, this column. Um, let's now switch over to the REST SBI documentation and see how it actually works. So um, yeah, we, we looked very, very briefly only at Open SBI at some point um, where, uh, you know, I, I, I think I summarized a bit the, um, like, that they have the different platforms implemented. And with Rust SBI, that's a bit different. So Rust SBI, uh, we can already close this. Goodbye. Uh, Rust SBI is actually a library and it's documented on the 
uh, crates website. So there is a, a website called docs.rs where you know you find the documentation of all the crates, uh, crates that provide one. And so that's also true for Rust SBI. And here is how you would actually use it. So in your supervisor software, so supervisor, uh, if you recall in RISC V, we have these different three modes. So there is the M mode, the machine mode, which is the highest privilege mode. Then we have the S mode, the supervisor mode, and then eventually the user mode. So that's like the general case for application processors. And you would transition between those different modes in order to run you know, different uh, code with different access privileges. So yeah, um, SBI features include boot sequence and a kernel environment. To bootstrap your kernel, place the kernel into the Rust SBI implementation defined address, and then Rust SBI will prepare an environment and jump to this address. So what this means is just what we saw in the picture. So we, uh, we, we have Rust SBI, just before the Linux kernel. And then when we say, hey, this is the address where our you know, Linux kernel is now loaded somewhere in DRAM, um, then Rust SBI would just jump to that address. And that is happening through a simple function call. And uh, since this is, um, so there, there is a bit of stuff to implement here. So I don't want to do everything uh, right now because it's uh, just too much for you know a rough hour. Um, I actually will uh, look at the D1 in comparison, so the D1 SLC, which is uh, already uh, fully implemented in Orboot, except for maybe some minor details, but they don't matter right now. And that's where we can see how the uh, SBI integration actually works with Rust SBI. So, yeah, but um, there is a, a bit more to consider because Rust SBI cannot just uh, set up the environment uh, by itself, and that is due to how uh, the whole SBI thing has been designed or, you know, the wider platform in general. So in RISC V, um, well, there there are different revisions now of, uh, well, not just SBI, but, you know, the whole platform design. And uh, in the, uh, let's say, legacy version, it's, it's actually uh, uh, an actual legacy version by now, um, SBI was uh, supposed to, uh, you know, set up uh, some handlers and those handlers would be necessary to call into uh, platform specific um, methods that map to certain registers in hardware. So those registers, uh, they would usually be memory mapped. And so, you know, you can already imagine if you design different processors, then the memory address of uh, some components that you need to address are a bit different. And that is especially true for the timer here. Um, there is a new uh, way of doing that now. So um, the new AIA platform design. So if you look at uh, the RISC V specifications, you search for AIA, the Advanced Interrupt Architecture. Um, th there, there is a bit more around that also around um, the PLIC, the Platform Local Interrupt Controller and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that, that can be set up a, a bit more easily than this here. Um, but this is what we currently have on the JH7100. So yeah, we look into this for now. Um, so yeah, this is roughly how it works. So there is a function, SBI call, and that is something that the operating system would call into for accessing certain methods. And well, there are two arguments which uh, have to be supplied. Uh, those here, arc zero and arc one. And those can then be used for uh, the specific handling. So uh, they actually map to the specific function that you want to call. So there is um, those two registers here, which map to those arguments, which are A0 and A1. Um, I'm sorry, I, 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 just, uh, I just messed this up a bit. So, okay, so A0 and A1 or arc zero and arc one, they are arguments to the function that you want to call. And the function that you want to call uh, is in A6 and A7. Those are different registers. So those two here, um, they are actually called extension and function here. Uh, it's just uh, how the wording is in the SBI specification. So in the SBI specification, they're saying 
uh, you, you can call extensions and within an extension you can call a specific function essentially or maybe vice versa I, I already uh, I'm a bit unsure currently but yeah it doesn't really matter uh, too much you know it's it's just that we're using by convention we're using registers to address the methods that we call I just call it method right now because it's just much easier than having these two mixed terms um, and then we have some arguments that we provide in addition and there is one very very nice use case for this actually and that is for debugging our platform so we can create a method which is just writing to the serial port and that is actually also part of the uh, specification there saying uh, you can supply this uh, method that you can just call to print a single byte to the serial port so yeah um, if you recall we, we have fully initialized our serial now so we can already do this output um, and so we can now also supply this uh, through a function so what, what we would do is we would just bind what we already have so the current code uh, we would just bind that to um, one of these SBI call methods and then when we want to bring up the operating system uh, in fact in Linux there is a simple configuration for it we can just tell it to use SBI for a console and then we can see if uh, you know the kernel crashes at some point you know something doesn't really come up uh, we can see why and that can be for example because something in I don't know in the platform detection didn't work out properly or whatever which is you know part of the um, the rest of the SBI setup that we do and well uh, there is this here um, this function gets spec version uh, so yeah in, in rest SBI um, we, we can actually say what version of the specification we implement so that the operating system knows how to handle it right so if we're saying hey this is now the legacy SBI implementation the kernel knows oh I actually need to call these and these methods first in order to proceed or you know I cannot use that other interface which was specified later so yeah, this is very important for the operating system so yeah um, yeah this here is just uh, an example for uh, the C programming language so this is essentially how the Linux kernel for example would do the SBI calls um, I mean it can be that the code looks a bit different actually in Linux now but this is roughly in the concept um, I want to highlight one thing now which is very important I will zoom in a bit and highlight this message here so this here non feature so there is a bit of a problem with you know having a very high privileged execution mode in a processor and just being able to uh, you know execute any arbitrary code so that would essentially already compromise the security of the platform and so uh, they're saying here rest SBI is designed to strictly adapt to the risk 5 supervisor binary interface specification the SBI specification other features useful in developing kernels and hypervisors may be included in other risk eco uh, rust ecosystem crates other than this package right so we don't and want to like bloat this up with you know un unnecessary stuff so what we would actually then do is we would just use another crate and add more functionality if we want it um, but if you want to contribute to rust SBI so you know uh, <laughs> this is um, th this is so uh, whatever fancy stuff you may need is not really supposed to live there um, but of course if you if you make something nice let's say you make a hypervisor uh, and you you know can just plug that into uh, the rest SBI ecosystem um, we, we can maybe just uh, I don't know add it to the readme or something like okay this works with uh, rest SBI uh, and this is how you can wire things up so yeah I mean that would uh, again uh, leverage the rust ecosystem right so we also talked about this earlier uh, where you know in, in C you don't really have this uh, concept of um, you know modules or you know what whatever uh, infrastructure that can provide you with modules you you know you just need to copy code around and so in, in Rust uh, we have this uh, hosted infrastructure um, well where we can just pull all the crates so we have this here for reading the documentation on GitHub we can just use repositories or you know if tags are being published there. Um, we can also just say like we want to use Rust SBI 022 for example here we just put that in our cargo toml file 
and then it knows where to actually get the uh, sources from. So yeah, um, it's it's a bit different from C. So yeah, hardware discovery and feature detection. I briefly already mentioned this uh, before. So um, in uh, you know in in different platforms, we we also talked about this year ACPI. Um, there, there can be different uh, methods of uh, you know discovering the whole uh, system. So yeah, let, let's just read this here very quickly. According to the RISC V SBI uh, specification, SBI does not specify any method for hardware discovery. Very important point. The supervisor software must rely on the other industry standard hardware discovery methods like device tree or ACPI for that. So if you uh, if you recall our image here, right? So we're we're talking about this down here, the device tree blob for Linux. So yeah, this actually also lives in the Linux repository uh, just for convenience, right? So Linux has its bindings and the device tree uh, describes the platform. So if we were to say, hey, this is a JH7100 and this is on the um, on the Vision 5 board, you know, we just put all of that in the device tree here and we say, I don't know, this here is, uh, this GPIO pin is actually an LED or, you know, uh, here, here you find uh, an SPI bus and, you know, attached to the SPI bus, let's say there is like, uh, I don't know, a display, for example, is something very common for SPI. Um, so yeah, that's SPI, not to confuse with SBI. Um, anyway, yeah, that's uh, what this here is about. Um, now there's uh, this other part to detect any feature under bare metal or under supervisor level developers may depend on any hardware discovery methods or use try execute trap methods to detect any instructions or CSRs. So yeah, if SPI is implemented in user level emulators, it may require to depend on operating system calls or use the signal trap method to detect any risk five core features. Yeah, this is uh, yeah, this is an interesting case. Yeah, we we don't really need to uh, look into that right now because we're not looking at uh, SBI emulation here, or uh, well, platform emulation in whatever sense. Uh, we're we're just running on bare metal, right? So uh, that would be the first part to apply here, and so yeah, in, in bare metal, uh, what we have in Risk Five is the CSRs, the configuration and status registers. Um, and we might need to look at the um, manual of the respective SOC or you know the processor core in order to figure out what CSRs exist and how we may need to use them. Um, but yeah, it's also not such a big concern for us right now because um, we, yeah, I, I think we don't really have much left uh, to implement to be honest. So we were already using I think some CSR for something. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. We, we, we will get back to that eventually anyway. So yeah, um, where can I get the REST SBI binary for a specific platform? Well, the answer is uh, you actually don't. So every platform just implements them. So chip or board manufacturers should provide their own SBI implementation project using REST SBI as a dependency. So yeah, if you uh, if you manufacture a chip or a board, you know, then you just um, you can just use Orboot and Rust SBI to you know implement your boot flow, and this is how you would uh, include Rust SBI. So you just pull it in as a library, and we're doing the same thing here with Orboot now. So yeah, um, the Rust SBI team provides reference <laughs> implementations for several platforms. Yeah, uh, if you look at the repositories, actually, if you go to um, GitHub.com/slash uh, I can look at REST SBI here. So this is actually the REST SBI repository, and this here is the REST SBI, uh, uh, the the organization on GitHub. There is a bunch of repositories, and there is, for example, one implementation uh, for the D1 SOC. There is one for the uh, BL808, you know, the K210, and so on. So these are uh, these three are different SOCs from different vendors. Well, and now here is one thing uh, we also talked a bit about. Uh, for us, SBI, REST SBI developers, this library adapts to the 
embedded Rust, embedded Hell crate. So that's also what we're using to implement our uh, our serial, for example, right? So uh, we're just implementing the write and read methods. Well, uh, read is just an empty function in our case because we don't actually uh, need console input in our early boot, uh, but we use the uh, write method uh, from embedded hell to output to the serial. And yeah, so we can do the same thing here. Um, there is this here, rest SBI e call. So this is uh, what we can use in our exception handler later as they write. And eventually uh, this function enter privilege. So this is where we do the mode switch from the machine mode to the supervisor mode. And this is also where we supply the address to, in, in our case, the Linux kernel in DRAM, or well, until we have Linux, uh, it could be the address of our um, of our U-boot part. So that's what we already have in Flash. And they're saying uh, the logo should also be printed if necessary when the binary is initializing. So yeah, um, they have a logo, I mean, just like, uh, you know, like, uh, open SBI as well. So we looked at the uh, vendor's boot flow before, and then we saw like some ASCII art logo. Uh, it's it's the same thing here. Well, um, and down here, we actually have the different uh, constants and structs and so on that we can use. And now let's see if we, uh, if we take a peek at the code for the D1 that we already have. Uh, just neglect what, what we just saw here. Um, for root D1. Yep, that looks good. So let's look at the source mainboard Sunshinor jar directory. Um, here we, we have this directory called main, so that's the second boot component. And here we have BT0. So BT0 is what we already have also for the uh, Vision 5 or the JH7100. So now we want to look at main, and in main, well, uh, we have a file source, main, just, you know, the REST convention, and, well, let me actually zoom in a bit for you. Right, so here, we're now using REST SPI functions. So we're using two things here, um, this here is the legacy std io, so that's the extension I just described earlier. So yeah, this is actually an extension now. Uh, it's the method to call for uh, using uh, serial output. And then this print here and this print uh, is a print macro that is provided by REST SBI. So we can, uh, instead of providing our own macro, we can also use the macro provided by REST SBI in order to print. Yeah. We will just have to see how this works out. So we were having some trouble with the um, with the first attempt of uh, having our print macro where we tried to use the spin crate and that always caused the machine to hang. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we will see. Uh, I, I'm not sure how currently how it's implemented in Rust SBI. Um, we, we can look into that a bit later. So let, let's first see uh, what other parts we have here. So. Yeah, this is, of course, not everything. Um, we do have a bit more. And this bit more is, um, it could be that we actually uh, call uh, Rust SBI call, call on something, whatever, directly instead of uh, using another import. Um, yeah, like here, for example, where we initialize this did IO. And if we, I, I'm just scrolling down here uh, through the main function. And well, here we go. Ah, yeah, this is, um, yeah, this is how we structured it a bit. So yeah, we, we have a sub module here, uh, not, not a git sub module, but you know, a, a module here uh, within this crate, which is called execute. And yeah, that is, um, it's imported here. So if, if we want to look at that, let me just arrange this a bit. So this is actually where we uh, define the uh, handlers for REST SBI. So we say execute supervisor here. So this is a wrapping function around uh, REST SBI's uh, supervisor uh, method. And this is now where 
um, we actually define the runtime behavior. So yeah, there is this thing here. Uh, we say new SPI supervisor. And then down here, uh, we describe how different um, events are being handled. So yeah, there are these uh, machine traps that you see here, which can occur. And uh, well, SPI call is one of them. Um, can also be that we run into an illegal instruction or it could also be a machine timer, an interrupt. Um, now here in, in this case though, and uh, that's actually what we want to do in general, uh, we, we just delegate all of this here. So we don't actually want to implement this. Uh, we leave this to the operating system. So the operating system uh, takes care of actually uh, you know, fulfilling everything that concerns the uh, platform. We only do what we cannot do in the operating system here in the SPI implementation. So yeah, um, let's actually go uh, back here again. Uh, I want to see something. I want to see if so we're, we're calling this function here, right? We give it the uh, Linux boot address and the DTB address. And those are, these arguments here. Yeah, we're, we're just renaming them a bit. Um, but it doesn't matter too much. So uh, we, we actually do pass them on like this here. So there is something called A0 and A1. So these are exactly like the uh, registers and the actual hardware. Let me just enlarge this a bit. So uh, those two here are for the heart that we are running on and the device tree blobs uh, address in memory. So yeah, if you look at the uh, call here, we're saying this is the DTB address. And the first thing here is the um, supervisor MEPC. MEPC is the machine something program counter. So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still coughing a bit and um, yeah, maybe I will actually cut a chart today again. Um, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, um, the supervisor MEPC, it's a program counter and we supply this to uh, this thing here, runtime new SPI supervisor. So let's see where runtime in turn comes from. So yeah, this is also part of our crate here. It's maybe not the perfect structure and we might uh, want to overhaul this as well. So yeah, uh, we will find this in here. And here we actually see the um, I think this should now be the eventual part where we actually call into uh, the actual method that is coming from the REST SBI crate. So here we say new SBI supervisor. Um, and there is something called supervisor context. All right, and prepare supervisor. So prepare supervisor is down here. Um, uh, this is where we take the MEPC into uh, the context of this thing here. So this is in, in self.context now. Huh. Where is actually the part where we, where we do the execution then? Um, so we say rt.resume. Okay. Huh. So when we say resume, is that where? Is that where we actually call into? Uh, interesting. So there, there is a. There is a place where, where we actually do this. I'm, I'm, I'm not finding it right now, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm wondering, so when we say new SPI supervisor, 
uh, we're creating this here called ANS. I guess it's short for answer. Um, and we just return back ANS. So what we do is we initialize runtime. Um, well, the struct here, and we just pass the context that we created. And in preparing the supervisor, hey, look, we're calling the reset method. And the reset method is uh, putting something on the machine stack. Oh, it's uh, assigning the machine stack here. Will be overridden by the resume function. Okay, so where is the resume function? Where does the resume function come from? So this runtime here. Huh. Oh, maybe, maybe, oh, look at this here. Right, so yeah, we're implementing a few more traits for runtime and we're going to search for resume. Here we go. All right, so this is, uh, let me actually close what we have here in the right hand side because it doesn't really concern us right now. Uh, hang on. Right, so yeah. Um, this is now the resume function. Uh, this is what we call eventually, and this is where um, we treat the different traps. So, yeah, well, when we get exceptions, uh, well, we turn them into machine traps here, like for the SBI call and so on, for example. Um, right. Um, Where is this point where, oh look, do resume this year. We need to look at that as well. Uh, and look at this, we're passing our context here. So this is where we prepared all of our information. Mm -hmm. And there is something called from machine safe that we're calling, which is down here. Interesting. So, oh, right. So this is where <laughs> uh, this is uh, part of saving and restoring registers. So, yeah, this is also very common. If you, uh, it's also on different other platforms when you um, wh when you call into something else, and, th and then you need to store the processor state somewhere. So, yeah, these are uh, registers to. Uh, I'm not sure what SD is uh, at, at this point. Um, yeah, we, we have some comments here which are in Chinese still. Uh, I guess we should translate them at some point. Um, yeah, yeah it, it could be that we're actually just saving the stack here. So this here, I think this should just be the stack pointer. So this here would be stack pointer, and then just um, the next uh, byte after, uh, and so on. So yeah, but but it says eight here, so that would actually be sixty four bit, right? So eight by eight. Um, yeah, so it's yeah, it's it's sixty four bits per uh, per part here. Right, that would make sense. Oh, and this is for the restore part. So, right, that makes sense. Um, and then there is this function here uh, to supervise or restore. Uh, right, ah, okay, so yeah. S, S is for store, and then L here, L is for load. Right, so we have store and load, um, store and load uh, instructions. Right, so this is where we store and save the processor state, and this is where we load and restore the processor state. Um, yeah, we're, we're actually loading a, a bit more, so we also load the argument registers here. 
I'm not exactly sure about the full mechanism of this. Um, yeah, we might need to look at that again as well. And then there is a counterpart for uh, when you don't come from machine mode, but from supervisor mode, where we would do the same counterpart thing. Uh, yeah, this is to machine store. This is from supervisor save. This is to supervisor resource and from machine. Okay. This is why I, I uh, got confused a bit as to why they looked a bit different. So this year is actually the counterpart to that thing. So this year is from machine save. Uh, save. This year is to machine restore. So this year is the counterpart to that part. Um, but it's actually switching to uh, supervisor mode again here. So to supervisor restore is just doing more stuff and from supervisor save. So this is where we save the state of the supervisor. It's actually this part here. So the question is where is from supervisor save being called? Oh look, um, that is here in the init part. And uh, yeah, this is using M MTVEC as the ma machine trap vector. So if uh, we if we if we get a machine trap, so the machine trap would occur when the operating system is making an uh, an SBI call or you know causing some whatever exception uh, that is being treated as a trap here. So the machine trap would then start uh, executing here. So yeah, we would just save the whole state of everything which was in the uh, supervisor mode. And then we would restore our machine mode context. So now, okay, now it makes sense. So we, we take everything which is in the supervisor state, we store that. Now we load what needs to be in the machine mode state. So this is the two machine restore here. And then we do whatever. Uh, we do whatever we, we restore, we restore our stuff. Um, now we can execute some code or whatever. Uh, and well, when, when we're done with everything that we wanted to do, um, at some point we would actually need to be calling uh, back. Well, actually, yeah, that, that is happening actually. Uh, I, I just overlooked it. So yeah, we have the, there was a return somewhere. Mm. This year, ah, there is there is a comment that says red. So yeah, but we're not using a, a, a return call from like uh, the bare instruction, um, but we're using this JR to RA. And RA is just a register. So that would be this year, right? I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get lost here anyway. So um, I hope this wasn't too confusing now and could give you a very rough understanding of uh, what would happen. Um, there is no, uh, no uh, main part yet in our JH7100 implementation. So yeah, I, I think we will uh, start drafting that next time. Um, and then maybe we can also get a bit of a better understanding when we just implement this uh, this whole thing here uh, again ourselves. So yeah, I think I will excuse myself now because uh, I'm, I'm losing my voice here. Uh, and so yeah, uh, with that, um, uh, thank you very much actually. And uh, yeah, take care and see you next time. Bye.